Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. This is the quarantine film series. Film series, you heard us right. We're doing brand extensions now. You may be familiar with the quarantine concert series, the live music concert series, but we started a film series. I'm your host, Kabir Segel, coming to you live from Atlanta, from my parents' place in the ATL. And my parents are on strict instructions not to be on the Wi-Fi signal, um, but I think they secretly watch. So hi, mom and dad. Um, we started this concert series uh, in the evening to put the spotlight on artists. These are people who play music throughout the year, and they lost all their gigs. So every night at 10 p.m. Eastern, we have wonderful performances um, from musicians all over the world. And uh, my friend Shane and I, uh, Shane, who produces this film concert um, film uh, broadcast. We created our first movie this past year, and we were excited to do the film festival circuit, and they've all been canceled, essentially, so we thought, why not share this platform with remarkable filmmakers? These are the people making films that will be on your um, streaming services in the coming um, the coming months, really, and, and hopefully the big screen. And so uh, with that, if you have any questions, um, you know, you're free to, feel free to drop a comment. Also, we want to know where you're watching from. I'm obviously in Atlanta. And uh, we want to know all the places that these broadcasts are are um, connecting with. So with that, I want to bring and introduce uh, Jason Sussbrook and David Alvarado, two remarkable filmmakers who made a movie called We Are As Gods. And um, the film was selected into South by Southwest, wonderful honor. And they've been working on this project for, for some time now. So please welcome to the broadcast, uh, David and Jason. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Of course, of course. So uh, let me ask you, David, first to begin. Um, tell us for the uninitiated, um, who is uh, what is the film about, and, and you know maybe you could talk a little bit about Stuart and his in his background. Sure. So the film's about really two things you could say. Uh, one is about this person named Stuart Brand. It's a biography of this person who a lot of people actually haven't heard of. I mean, when you say the name Stuart Brand, half the time somebody says, "I don't know." Who that is the other half somebody says oh my god Stuart Brand I used to own a whole earth catalog or I've, I know about him because of the beginning of the environmental movement and uh, the, the modern version of that in the 1960s or oh my god I, I know about him because of his efforts to de-extinct the woolly mammoth so so if you don't know who he is um, he, uh, he's sort of connected to all these things that you do know about um, when you think about Steve Jobs and his famous uh, commencement speech uh, at Stanford University, uh, Steve's basically quoting Stuart uh, at the beginning, the middle, and the end. He's saying that Stuart created this thing called the Whole Earth Catalog that was like a Bible to his generation, the hippie generation. Uh, and so, and so, uh, we're fond of saying that Stuart Brand is like your favorite band's favorite band. It's just that that, that person that's out there who's influenced a lot of people that, and, and projects that you have heard of. So, in part, it's a biography of, of his life, but also it's very specifically. Also about the his modern effort today to resurrect extinct species, and and if if that uh, sounds like Jurassic Park, that's because it kind of is like Jurassic Park. But it's not about dinosaurs; it's about recently extinct animals that humans have recently killed off. So we're talking woolly mammoths, Tasmanian tigers, um, animals that have been killed off in the last you know few tens of thousands of years. He wants to bring back into existence to try to reset those ecosystems back to their original um, state. So whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, uh, we explore that in the film. Gotcha. How did you first uh, come across um, Stuart Brand, uh, Jason, and why were you making a film is a multi-year commitment? Uh, why did you want to spend a few years of your life making this? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, I guess I was always fascinated by Stewart's foundation, the Long Now Foundation, which was this uh, organization that was trying to build this 10,000 year clock uh, to get humanity to think long term. Um, so I, I actually ran across Stuart Brand really kind of early on in college um, through the, the, the book that he wrote, uh, which was kind of like an ode to thinking long term and the virtues of thinking long term and how that would make humanity more responsible. But it actually all, um, even before that, it began with a, uh, a whole earth catalog, which I actually have 
here on my bookshelf. Ta-da. Um, this picture here, uh, which is basically like a compendium, David mentioned this, the, of just stuff in the counterculture that was popular in the 60s. Um, and I actually ran across a, a copy of the Whole Earth Catalog back in college at this old used bookstore that I used to go to called Logos. And when I saw it, I thought it was this weird artifact of the past, but when you popped it open, it actually ended up being like a compendium of things uh, that people were still using today or resonated um, with the counterculture, but also, uh, you know, had had sticking points that people could actually like look at and be like, oh, I'm familiar with CB radios. I'm familiar with this camping equipment um, or whatever resources that they printed. So it was in a way it was a relic of the past, but it was like a time capsule of the future. Um, and so I, I just remember poking through it. I bought it for like 30 bucks, which was expensive at the time. And um, I sort of filed that away in my brain. And then years later, when David and I started working together, um, we thought about doing a film on Stuart. Um, and around that time, that's when he started his, his de-extinction movement, which was this movement to bring back the passenger pigeon, the woolly mammoth, other species. And at the time I was already really interested in Stuart's story, his biography. And so at that time, David and I made a, a short for Time Magazine. It was just um, a five minute video because we knew one of the editors at Time Magazine and, um, and they published it. And afterwards we asked Stuart, this is 2014 or maybe 2013, what do you think about making a movie about you? And he respectfully declined. And I don't even think he responded to the email. He just kind of ignored it. And then uh, we went off and did other things. We made a, another movie about Bill Nye. We came back four years later and said, hey, let's make a movie about your life. And then this time he took a flyer on it and decided to, he wanted to collaborate with us. Gotcha, gotcha. Has he seen the movie? Has he seen the end product? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he loves it. So we always show uh, the film to our subject before we show it publicly. So our subjects are never involved in the creation of the film. Uh, they were just giving us access to their lives. And so um, we're always a little bit nervous um, because, of course, the person's heavily invested in the outcome of the film. I mean, this is their life, uh, but it's our perspective of their life. So there's always this fear that they won't like it or um, they'll have issues with, you know, factual um, uh, statements made in it. And so, you know, when we, when we did the film without Bill Nye, the science guy, it, it was, it was the same kind of fear. Like, what will they think? Oh no, if they don't like it, you know, we can't change it at this point. So it's, it's sort of just, uh, it'll just be what it is. Uh, but fortunately, yes, yeah, Stuart, Stuart enjoyed it. He enjoyed even the criticism because we, we push back on him. Um, and, and we have other scientists who are trying to explain that this de-extinction effort may be not the best idea. And these are the reasons why, but he, he really enjoyed the film, which was, which was good. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. And, um, talk to me about, um, the craft of making it. So, uh, what did you guys shoot on camera wise? Um, and what was the, the post-production part of it as well? Sure. Like, uh, so yeah, we, we shot on two different cameras for the most of it. We shot on the, the Canon C300. Uh, Mark II, which is a really great camera. We've really enjoyed it. We used a bit of that in our last film as well. Uh, but then we switched to the the Red Gemini, actually, uh, you know, maybe two thirds of the way through production. Uh, we just really liked the image that the Red produced. We were always kind of afraid of it um, because there's a lot of, a lot of disagreement about whether it can be, do a lot of field production, but we actually have enjoyed it quite a lot. And um, and post-production, uh, we we have a large post-production team. The production team is rather small. It's, it's it's Jason and myself, and usually a couple of other people. Um, the post-production team is much larger, and, and you know we had two editors who were amazing, um, and uh, we had uh, a large uh, sound team. We we did our sound work at Skywalker, you know. So it's always um, a pleasure to be working at the, you know, in, in a suite next to the place where they're creating Star Wars, you know, it's, <laughs> there's laser sounds going off over there and then we're working on our, our documentary over here. And so it's, um, it's, uh, it's quite a thrill. I'm a big uh, music fan. 
Uh, Jason, maybe you could talk about the soundtrack and who you got involved to make the uh, the wonderful soundtrack here. Yeah, we are totally fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with one of our musical idols, uh, which is Brian Eno. Um, that was an incredible, just fortuitous experience. Um, it, it turns out that, you know, Stuart and Brian are actually very good friends. Um, Brian was a fan of the Whole Earth Catalog and followed Stuart's career long before they met. Um, and we had the opportunity to interview Brian as a film subject who he gave this unbelievable lights out, brilliant interview that was only like 45 minutes, but if everything he said was relevant. And so we used the interview in the film to explain who Stuart is and the modern environmental movement. Um, but we also uh, asked if he would, if he would contribute original music um, to the film and Brian has done many soundtracks in his amazing um, career, uh, mostly for documentaries. And so we, we figured it was worth a shot asking him if he wanted to contribute music. His initial answer was he's just too busy and he's retired from music um, or at least from soundtracks. But um, with, not without any really provocation on our part, we kind of you know took his answer and said, okay, thank you. But um, later on, uh, he ended up he changed his mind and ended up um, contributing 25 um, original pieces of music that are just you know typical Brian Eno brilliance. Uh, it was very ambient. Um, they it gives the film the emotional resonance we wanted, but it didn't step on any of the emotional moments or tell viewers what to think. It just sort of helped elevate the emotions that were already there. So um, working with him was a total delight and is definitely one of those career highlights that we get to, you know, even though the film didn't have the premiere we wanted to, in many ways, this is the ideal film, um, at least on the production side and the, and the crafting of it, because um, we got to work with amazing people and Brian is one of them. Yeah, sounds like it. What is the, um, you mentioned some of the, um, the pushback on this. So what is the debate around extinction and de-extinction and the pros and cons of this initiative? Maybe David, you could talk about that. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, right. Well, uh, you can think about it in terms of, uh, the environmental movement. So, uh, let's say, you know, you call yourself an environmentalist, uh, you you probably want to take care of the earth. You want you want to be a good steward of it, and and not put the interests of humanity over all things. So you want a better uh, world, and and so even in that camp, you can sort of divide it into two. Uh, one camp uh, you could argue is the environmentalist that says, okay, so the way to do that is um, to not touch anything. Uh, we've done so much damage uh, to ecosystems, you know, the forests, the oceans, everything. Let's just Tell everybody, and everybody should agree to stop doing things, stop burning oil, stop stop consuming energy, stop trash, you know, polluting all this stuff, and, and that's a perfectly valid approach. I mean, just tell if everybody could just stop polluting, we wouldn't have pollution. It, it really is that simple. Uh, the other camp in environmentalism says, "Well, that'll never happen. Um, so, how do we take steps and uh, and real ways that could actually work to?" Um, to alter the earth, to sort of develop new technologies so that we're not doing those kinds of uh, damages. And so Stuart's in the second camp where he says, look, we're not going to be able to um, reverse, we're not going to be able to tell people to stop killing animals, they're going to keep doing it. So let's add a new tool to our tool set to try to reverse the extinctions that other humans are causing. And so um, you know, this, this is an argument that a lot of people in the first camp would say, well, wait a minute, if you do that, then uh, then people will just have no qualms killing animals because somebody else is going to come along and fix the problem that I created. And so yeah. there's this real argument that that is by no means settled, um, but it, it is an argument that that needs to be discussed. I mean, we hope that people watch the film and at least come away talking about these things. Like, you know, there's this whole field of, of science called uh, geoengineering, which a lot of people aren't talking about, but um, it really is, you know, when we're talking about trying to reduce carbon emissions, yes, we should try to do that as much as possible. But we're already to the point where reducing carbon emissions is not going to do enough uh, of, of the changes that we need to do to prevent all the disaster we're trying to prevent. 
So geoengineering is a concept in that second camp of environmentalism that Stuart's a part of that says, well, it's too late, there's too much carbon. We should build giant you know, engines around the planet in different places, sucking all that carbon out of the air, processing it and, and get it into the ground or just you know, uh, turn it into other things. For example, you can turn it into um, CO2 for soda, uh, things like that and, 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 and process it. Uh, so it's not just about the emission reduction, it's about getting it out of the air, basically becoming ultimate stewards of the entire planet and treating it like it's our backyard. And so this is extremely controversial because, you know, who has the right to decide the carbon, the CO2 levels in the air? Mm-hmm. Where are we in the de-extinction effort? I mean, when will the woolly mammoth or the hybrid woolly mammoth be awakened? It's <laughs> a good question. Jason. Um, yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a great question. I think they, now they're, they're, the whole de-extinction movement writ large, there's all these different animal projects and plant projects that make up the de-extinction movement. And we get into it in the movie, uh, the various efforts. There's the passenger pigeon, there's the great auk, there's the American chestnut, and there's the woolly mammoth. The one project that is really exciting that we we showcase in the movie is the great American chestnut tree. And that was actually extinct around 100 years ago. They used to comprise one you know, quarter of the eastern seaboard's uh, trees. And it basically went extinct within 50 years because of a fungus brought over from uh, a florist uh, that was working with um, Chinese uh, flowers. And so that fungus came through, wiped out a billion uh, chestnut trees. Um, that it was devastating. And it, uh, it, it made the whole ecosystem that much poorer. And so that tree is actually on the way back. They figured out a way to genetically engineer it using uh, a gene gun to transfer genes from wheat into the into the chestnut tree. And now they're being grown in uh, a lab in upstate New York and Syracuse. And they actually have a plot of trees that are ready to go into the forest to help repopulate uh, the Eastern seaboard where basically this tree was just eradicated. Um, because of us, because of global travel, because of human intervention, and with human intervention, we can bring it back. So that that project is just waiting FDA approval, and it's now a GMO, and so now you have to consult various uh, bureaucratic agencies to tell you know when it's okay for this tree to go back into the wild, if it's okay to have a, a, a genetically modified organism into the wild. Um, so there's these larger sort of bureaucratic uh, machinations that are preventing it from being Uh, planted. The woolly mammoth project, that is anybody's guess. What what they've been able to do is actually take the 12 genes that they're trying to uh, distinguish between the woolly mammoth and the elephant, the Asian elephant, which are already 99.9 or 99.89 percent similar to the Asian elephant. That's the difference between the two species. And so they're just trying to identify 12 of those genes and try to insert those into a live cell line. Um, and that those 12 genes are, uh, you can use your imagination, but it's woolly. <laughs> so like long hair, um, blood that uh, can actually uh, rush to create a, like um, insulation in the, um, in, in the woolly mammoth. Uh, fat, like the subcutaneous, uh, or sorry, sorry, sub, um, yeah, I think it's subcutaneous uh, fat. It's like 12 inches of blubber that basically prevents cold from uh, freezing these animals. Uh, smaller ears so they don't freeze. There's there's these genes that they're trying to get into a live cell line. And then once they do, then they have to actually create an artificial womb uh, to incubate this uh, creature. Um, or they have to figure out a way to clone uh, the woolly mammoth once they get it into an embryonic cell line that can then be fertilized and turned into a a hybrid elephant uh, woolly mammoth. So this could be a decade away, it could be two decades away, but the science is happening very fast. The the ability that George Church, who is um, Stewart's collaborator in his church lab, um, the ability for them to make progress is kind of astounding. Um, and they're doing so with very little money and it's sort of like a side project that they're doing. And um, George is, uh, is, is making progress at a breakneck speed. So we could hopefully see it within the next decade. 
Interesting. Uh, a great way of, uh, of you clearly understand the science and the and the process here. So I think thanks for explaining this uh, and breaking it down. What has to happen? Um, maybe Dave, you can talk about how has quarantine life affected the the plans for this movie. Uh, what was going to happen that didn't happen? What's the opportunity cost of the quarantine for the film? Yeah, it's uh, a great question. Um, the uh, it's very much what's happening to the music industry, which you know a lot about. I mean, you know, the, our whole industry, at least the launch of the film, is predicated on the idea that people will gather in a dark room with a bunch of other people uh, for a couple hours and watch something on 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 screen, you know, or in the case of music, you know, on stage. And so it's um, that's sort of uh, always been the beginning of sell process, you know, because Jason and I, we make films ourselves. Um, you know, we raise the money ourselves, we make it ourselves. And then when it's a complete film, we take it to market. And, and that essentially means film festivals, movie theaters, and try to find the buyers that are interested in the film that we've created. And so um, this is the first time that we've released a film. We're, this is our fourth documentary in, and uh, it's the first time that we just there's no marketplace uh, to, to consider buying the film. And so uh, we suspect that'll change. Uh, you know, uh, once we have a few months, people are going to adjust. The streamers like Netflix, we hope, are interested in um, uh, buying other products for acquisition. But, uh, you know, time, time will tell. Uh, for the time being, it's, it's, it's very unclear um, who, who's going to buy the film. So we're just waiting patiently. Got it. Got it. Well, you know, we wish you the best with the venture. Uh, where can people find out more? Um, looks like it's right here. Structure Films. That's your website. Yes, yeah, so structurefilms.com. You can learn about our, our production company and see our past projects. Uh, the film itself has a website. Um, we are as gods uh, You can see a trailer uh, to the film as well as a scene um, where uh, we're, we're highlighting some of Brian Eno's music. So you can check out that website and um, take a look at that. Cool. So everyone, if you're watching live or watching the um, broadcast, check out structurefilms.com. Um, also, um, check out the website of the film. Also, look for David and Jason on social media um, to get um, their takes on everything, if you guys are on. And uh, we all are looking forward to seeing the film. Wishing you all the best with uh, what looks like an amazing project. So uh, congratulations also on the South by Southwest selection. No small feat and all the other festivals you were accepted into. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for um, joining this um, edition of the Quarantine Film Series. I want to give a big uh, shout out to uh, our producer, Shane. If you're ever in the Los Angeles area, try Shane's hummus. He makes it from scratch. So um, just knock on his door. Surprise him. That's right. So um, 10 p.m. Eastern every single night for great music. Um, tonight we have a uh, wonderful Spanish guitarist, Juancho Herrera, and we will see you then. Have a great day, everyone.